Join with me in prayer. May our hearts be open to hearing God's word. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother was ruler of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet of Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall shall see the salvation of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. (laughs) So... My five-year-old granddaughter, Promise, she gives the peace sign all the time. You you look in pictures, and there's Promise, and sometimes she's like this, and sometimes she forgets to get this finger up, and it looks differently. But she's giving you the peace sign, really. And so I wondered, does she know what that is or what it means? And so I asked her. And she said, well, this is the peace sign. And I said, do you know what it means? And she said, no. So now I pushed her a little bit. And she said, well, Grandma, it means two. (laughs) Now, what is intriguing to me is this young girl has such a deep longing for peace. And every time she flashes her peace sign, it's a prayer for peace. A prayer she doesn't know she's saying. A prayer that hasn't been on her lips. A prayer that was formed in her heart at such a tender age. Far-fetched, you may say, but I believe we are all hardwired for peace. And I also believe that the upheaval and losses caused by the pandemic, as well as the conflict and divisiveness from the past administration, and let's face it, politics in general, the unrest in our nation and the extreme pushback to racial, gender, and sexual equality movements are the impelling forces that have exacerbated mental health issues, especially in children. Their peace has been taken from them. The Kaiser Family Foundation says that during COVID, children have experienced major, major disruptions, including school closures, social isolation, financial hardships, and gaps in healthcare access. Many parents have reported poor mental health outcomes in their children throughout the pandemic. And research shows that 31% of parents said their child's mental or emotional health was worse than before the pandemic. Kids have been irritable, clingy, fearful, tired, They are unable to eat and sleep properly. And the CDC reports that there was a 22.3% spike in emergency room trips for potential suicides by children aged 12 to 17. And CBS reports that as of October, shootings have claimed 1,165 lives and left 3,216 youths injured. Our children do not have an experience of peace, 
true peace. And the ancient Israelites did not have peace either. Judea was under direct Roman rule during which time the Roman governor was given authority to punish by execution. And Pilate, as I mentioned last week, brutalized the people of Judea. The general population also began to be taxed by Rome, a population that was already poor, and that money was given to Rome, not to the temple. And in our lectionary text, Luke's litany of imperial, religion, regional, and religious authorities does more than date John's ministry. It also contrasts human kingdoms with God's kingdom. The claims to authority that Tiberius or Herod or the high priest make, may make are not ultimate. God's people owe allegiance first and foremost to God. And it is God's word that sets John's ministry into motion. John received the word of God out in the wilderness. Where do you receive the word of God? Sometimes I receive it driving. Sometimes I receive it when I'm listening to Billy play. The word of God is everywhere and it is tucked away in our hearts. But John received it in the wilderness, which tells us that wilderness times do not necessarily need to be a time of fear. Many life-giving truths can be revealed in the wilderness, a place where we are usually more receptive to hear them. And it is in the wilderness that John was commissioned to prepare the way for Jesus, who comes with a new message, a new way of life, a new ministry. And what does Jesus give us? to prepare us for our own ministries? Peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, Jesus said. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Which brings us back to the question I asked promise. What is peace? Now, the peace of God is different from the peace of the world. Biblical peace is more than just the absence of conflict and more than a state of inner tranquility. It is the presence of something better in its place. Now, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom, and the basic meaning, I mean basic, basic meaning, is complete or whole. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations, and when any of these is out of alignment or missing, shalom breaks down. We no longer have wholeness. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. Now the Greek word for peace is irene. It originates from the root word of iro, which means to join, to join, or to tie together into a whole. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in the world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Taking what's broken. Our children are broken. And until they are complete and restored to wholeness, we as a society, as a community, as a world will not know true peace. How do we shalom them? How do we make them restored to wholeness? Because at, 
as Phil Campbell said during Luncheon Lectionary, there are times in life, and some of those times are preparatory times, which are just as necessary as fulfillment and implementation times. We are in a preparatory time, a time to prepare for peace, a time to prepare for the way of peace. So let me offer some suggestions. First, we must always, always remember that black lives matter. Recently, after a shooting in Aurora, the media reported it as a gang shooting. I want to suggest that they are dog whistle words that mean it was a black person shooting another black person, so nothing to see here, it doesn't matter. But it does matter because black lives matter. We care that our children are shooting and our children are being shot. Black lives matter. And let's be honest, a nation without peace has created domestic terrorism. White nationalists who have become vigilantes who believe they will create peace with their guns. But they also started life as children. They also started life as children. And these children have so much pain and sorrow in their souls. How can they possibly have peace? But to bring peace, we have to work to restore relationships. Relationships we've never had. Relationships that are broken. Without authentic relationships, we cannot heal the brokenness in the world. And Jesus taught us how to do this by seeing people by walking with them where they are in life and restoring them in ways in which they needed to be restored, not in ways we think they needed to be restored. And thereby restoring ourselves in the process. And children watch us. To coin a phrase, they know whether we've been good or bad. So let's listen to what our youth have to say. Listen to what we as a society have done to hurt them so that we can know how to restore them to wholeness. And John proclaimed a baptism of repentance, which means turning toward God. But let us begin by repenting. Repenting for the times that we have not listened to our youth. For the times that we have not seen them listening to us. For the opportunities that we've taken away from them. For the times we've not seen their future. Let us repent for the times we told them their feelings weren't right or appropriate or acceptable. Or the times we told them to keep their feelings to themselves. Let us repent for the times we've been unimaginative in our problem solving and for the times we've been apathetic and for the times that we've exploited children for propaganda. I recently saw a picture of two young boys, four and six, with Let's Go Brandon t-shirts on. Do you think there's peace in their lives? And it's not just the right that does this. And for all of these, we ask forgiveness. And after we repent, let us work to bring peace, to make a shalom in their lives and in ours. Because as Martin Luther King Jr. said, true peace is the presence of justice. Let us continue our social justice work, our work for gun control, for fair immigration, for educational opportunities, and not just college, but whatever interests youth. 
for economic opportunities for all, for health care and reproductive care, so that children, all children in every nation, can know true peace. Because no justice, no peace. Amen.